Does Birmingham need a high-speed rail link with London? Controversy boils. You mentioned mitigation a large number of times, but nothing about noise mitigation. The lot of houses in that area, the Coventry side and the Kendall side, and suddenly this, this thing is going to come out of a cutting. It all sounds so familiar, but this is not 2015. It is 1833, and the line is the London and Birmingham Railway, the first intercity line into the capital. Along the route, there was strong opposition from landowners, who predicted that their fox hunting would be ruined by the iron horse, while others believed their lives and livelihoods would be destroyed and the old coaching towns left destitute. Despite this opposition, the Enabling Act was passed in 1833. London and Birmingham Railway is hugely important. It's 1830s, and it's probably the first example of a, a, a long-distance mainline railway that we have in this country, and, and hence pretty much anywhere. In 1825, the first public railway opened Stockton and Darlington. In 1830, the first intercity railway, the Liverpool and Manchester. But the London and Birmingham Railway was over 100 miles long. It was a huge undertaking and connected the first and second cities of the United Kingdom. An awful lot of work was done to refine their plans to fully understand the business case, the business need for a railway. About 20,000 navvies carved through city streets, burrowed through hillsides and spanned rivers attracting groups of tourists and spectators who came to marvel. One of those who was captivated by these sights was a little-known London artist, John Cook Bourne. Bourne's early sketches were very much of the excavations and the building work that was being undertaken in central London. As you can imagine, building a railway through a crammed city meant that many buildings had to be destroyed, roads had to be broken up, huge trenches had to be dug to accommodate the railway. That's along with engine houses and all sorts of structures that, that went with it. Bourne's meticulous lithographs allow us to follow the line as it was constructed. We begin our journey here in the heart of London at Euston Station. Of course, the first thing we see is this wonderful Doric arch, the entrance portico to the station itself. The station was actually relatively small. It's amazing to see this use of classical architecture. These forms have been around for thousands of years and it's almost as if the railway company deliberately used this style of building to make a statement to say that they and their works were going to be around for another 2,000 years after. When the railway was first built, the, the steepness of the, the, the first two miles of the line was considered too much for the locomotives of the day to handle. So they had to build a stationary engine that effectively hauled the train up those first couple of miles before the track levelled out and they could use locomotives to carry on their journey. But we've got something here that looks almost like the building of the pyramids and it's literally swarming with hundreds and hundreds of people. And these are the people that we see in the sketches that Bourne produced of the navvies. These are the people who, through blood, sweat and tears, actually built the railway pretty much by hand. It's a superb image that gives us a sense of the scale of the undertaking. This image was produced in 1836, and it shows the excavations at Park Street, the building of a retaining wall. Just a few years after this image was made, Charles Dickens wrote in Dombey and Son about the first tremors of a great earthquake that were tearing up the heart of London. And this is exactly what he was looking at when he was thinking of those words. We can see how this huge scar has been dug right through existing buildings, butting up either side of the railway itself. We get a fantastic sense of the smooth, as in the finished retaining wall on the right-hand side, along with the really rough sides where the excavations are still taking place. This image of the cutting at Tring is superb, provides us a huge amount of detail about how the navvies actually went about building a railway. We can see the steep sides of the cutting, and we can see these barrow runs that were used to, to haul the barrows full of spoil up 
and over the side so they could be disposed of elsewhere. And again, we can get a sense of the scale of the undertaking. The entire railway cost over five and a half million pounds. In the 1830s, that was a vast amount of money. The Kilsby Tunnel was one of the most impressive pieces of engineering along the line, indeed anywhere at the time. There were a whole series of working shafts along with two huge ventilating shafts. This particular image captures one of the working shafts and it shows one of the skips being lowered down into the, into the heart of the tunnel. We can see this shaft of light coming down into the tunnel. And this isn't artistic license. We know from documentary evidence that the atmosphere within the tunnel was so humid that when the sun was directly overhead, a fantastic shaft of light would come down right into the heart of the darkness and illuminate the working area. At the end of our journey, we arrive in Birmingham, and here we are at Curzon Street Station. Again, this is a structure that's been styled in the, 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 the classical architectural style that we saw with Euston. And it's nice to think that there was perhaps a little bit of metropolitan swagger being exported from London here to the industrial heartlands of the West Midlands. Bourne's works captured the imagination of his contemporaries. His work on the London and Birmingham Railway received a huge amount of praise at the time. It's very interesting to see the almost unfettered enthusiasm that the, the, the people who could afford his prints had for works of this nature. That demonstrates to, to us really how new and exciting those images really were. Today, passengers on the West Coast Line still glimpse the engineering marvels captured by Bourne as they speed by. Now you can view John Cook Bourne's works in a free exhibition to check the tide of prejudice until the 10th of September. Read more in this new book, The Picturesque Railway by Dr Matt Thompson, available at the History West Midlands Bookshop.